Hi guys, so I'm Dan Weatherall again. Um, call me doctor if you want, I didn't put it on this one. Um, this is the danger of thinking up two EMF camp talk proposals off the top of your head and thinking they won't like both of those. Uh, and then here we are. Um, <clears throat> so, basically, um, this talk is not, I'm no expert in hacking USB devices. I'm not some kind of wizard hacker or anything. I design cameras for a living, come on. Uh, it's totally different. Um, I feel like you often you often notice that there are like these like amazing people who have these super skills in something like you know maybe writing kernel drivers or whatever, and you think it would take me five years to learn how to do that. And I thought it was the same with like reverse engineering random USB devices. It turns out it's much easier than you think it is, uh, or at least it's much easier than I thought it was going to be. And so I'm going to like share some of my experiences and try and encourage everybody to hack random rubbish Chinese USB devices you can buy off eBay. Um, so well, a lot of people have turned up, so maybe like this will uh, narrow it down a bit. Why would you want to hack random USB devices? For me, because I only use reasonable operating systems. And, um, well, I don't know whether you count risk OS as reasonable, but, um, for example, I buy this uh, USB missile launcher. Brilliant. Uh, plug it in. Oh, not natively supported in the Linux. And uh, it comes with some random rubbishy MFC control interface designed in Windows 95. Um, so that's unfortunate. It would be nice to like be able to fire USB missiles how I want to do it. Um, the reason you should know about USB as a hacker on computer stuff, in my opinion, is that everything is USB nowadays. Uh, and we can argue about whether well, that's a good thing or not, but uh, it is. So uh, if you don't on, if you have this mental block about looking at USB devices and how they work and what the data is, then you're going to have uh, difficulty hacking a lot of devices, and it's a real problem. Um, this talk is a basic overview of how USB works from a layman's perspective. I'm, I do programming. I'm not a programmer. Um, uh, how to get started reverse engineering USB devices simply, simple ones, um, and how to get started. I'm not going to talk you all the way through it. Uh, writing user space driver code. Uh, in Linux and also OS X and Windows. You can, LibUSB works on Windows, it's not so pleasant there. Um, but nearly every USB device you buy is supported on Windows, right? <laughs> if you buy a USB device and it's not supported on Windows, the manufacturer has some serious questions to answer. Um, so <clears throat> what this is not is like how to reverse engineer a serial stream format. So like, you know, once I can communicate with the device and it uses some ridiculous encrypted serial protocol, uh, how do you sort that out? I mean, that's like, that is, that is elite stuff that I have no idea how it works. Um, it's not how to write something for some super complicated, super fast, super high speed USB device, which is really difficult. Um, luckily, USB audio interfaces are class based, so that's fine. Um, and it's also not like a super deep look into how USB works, because it's actually very complicated. Uh, it's also not about USB 3, because USB 3 has changes quite a few things. Um, so what is USB? Universal Serial Bus. Clue is in the name. To my mind, and nothing, none of this is official, right? But to my mind, it's basically a replacement for UARTs and serial ports. And by replacement, I mean it's something that computer manufacturers put on there because uh, it had a lot of, it has a lot of new features, and you can do a lot of stuff with it that were quite difficult with old-style serial ports. There, it's faster than a serial port, but it doesn't have to be. There's no reason, in principle, you couldn't build an RS-232 interface that worked at 50 megabits. Uh, the error correction would be pretty awful, but you could do it maybe. Um, the problem with that is that for us as people wanting to actually look at our hardware and, and, and roughly know how it works, especially for me as a hardware guy, not a software person, is that UARTs and serial is extremely convenient to hack. If you have an oscilloscope or a logic analyzer, uh, you can reverse engineer the entire protocol layer of a, a serial device simply because you just, you just you put your probe on, right? work out the baud rate by counting how fast the pulses are, set another computer to that board rate, and it will talk to you, right? A serial device doesn't have any kind of, um, oh, no, sorry, sir, can't talk to you. A USB device does, and that's the main problem I found when, when starting to hack. Um, the problem with the serial port, right, is that you have to agree the board rate first. Nowadays, most serial devices are 115, 200 board. Um, but they aren't all, uh, and you have to know that. If you set your receiving serial port to the wrong baud rate or the wrong stop bit or whatever, wrong parity, um, 
what you get will be at best garbage, at worst nothing. Um, so that's one downside. Uh, by which I mean, really, serial devices, RS-232 devices and such, are not self-describing in any meaningful way. There is no way for the device to tell the host what, how fast it should be or what parameters I should use. And there's no easy device multiplexing. If I plug two, two serial devices onto the same serial port, unless they are specifically designed to be used that way and have some kind of arbitration scheme on the, on the bus, you're just, just like driving two trains in opposite directions into each other, right? It's not going to work. Uh, USB, obviously, does. Um, so, USB, how, basically, what is it? It's basically a differential pair, data plus, data minus, for, signal, for data signaling. Uh, USB 3 has other pairs as well. We won't get into that, as I said. Um, it's a fast differential pair, but it's literally just a pair of wires for data, just like a UART, except not just like a UART. But uh, UART is, you know, one for transmit that way, one for transmit that way. USB is a differential pair, which is half duplex. So a USB line can only ever transmit either that way or that way uh, at one time. Um, but it's just a single data pair. Um, the devices are connected in what's called a tiered star topology. So you have one, the sensor, and you plug several into that, and you can plug several into that. Um, and interestingly, this is one important thing I found about USB. All communications in USB, except for USB 3, are initiated by the host, right? Even if you have something like a mouse or a keyboard, I'm going to hopefully show you this later, um, where you would expect that when I press the button on the keyboard, it's sending a, a signal to the, to the computer. No, what's actually happening, uh, because USB... Uh, has this thing where we have a host and a device. It's, you know, upper class, working class, right? Um, <laughs> you, there is always a host and there is always a device. A, a device cannot do anything on its own. It has to be told what to do. Um, read into that what you like. But the, even on a keyboard, what is happening is the host is asking the keyboard, has he pressed the button yet? Has he or she pressed the button yet? Uh, and the keyboard says, yes, it's Q or no, right? Um, so that's basically how it works. Uh, USB devices are, to some extent, self-describing. So if I plug a keyboard into a USB port, the host knows that it's a keyboard because the keyboard has told it that it's a keyboard, right? Um, so there are these various terms used uh, in relation to USB, uh, low speed or full speed. Nowadays, uh, there's no such thing as low speed USB devices anymore, really, but uh, full speed USB is, means USB 1.1. That's in Linux, controlled by a driver called OHCI. Uh, high speed is USB 2. That's EHCI. And super speed is USB 3, which is XHCI. Um, the electrical interface, as I say, is it looks very simple there. Um, it's just a differential pair. And so you could look at that in a scope. It's not super, super fast. You don't need an amazing scope to look at it. But the packet format is incredibly complicated. Um, what I'm going to try and say to you guys today is that luckily it doesn't matter that the packet format is incredibly complicated because that is the bit that everyone agrees on. <laughs> so when you're reverse engineering something, what you're trying to find is the bit that everyone doesn't agree on, the, the bit that's vendor specific or, or, or to do with that device. Uh, I wanted to spend a bit of time to kind of put this in perspective doing the VHS versus Betamax of USB and Firewire um, <laughs> because I think it's actually a very good analogy. Um, USB is a tiered star configuration. Firewire was a tree configuration. If you've ever seen a Firewire device, right, uh, most of them have two ports on. And that's because Firewire can be a tree configuration. You can daisy chain them. USB, you can't. USB, as I said, the host initiates all communications. With Firewire, any node can initiate communication. So with a Firewire device, like a, a DV camera, for example, is a classic example, uh, Firewire is ideally suited to things like streaming video because your device can say, here's some video, have it, right? Um, USB, that can't happen. Um, USB can supply power. Brilliant. 5 volts, 500 milliamps. Firewire, if you implement the full uh, spec, uh, I've not tested a Firewire device for this, but is 30 volts at 3 amps. <laughs> so, yes. Um, USB protocol is implemented entirely in software. Firewire is implemented in a nice, expensive, fast ASIC. It can do DMA transfers into your CPU, so there's a hideous security risk with Firewire, right? You know, if you don't have that configured properly, someone can just plug a Firewire device into your Firewire controller and do uh, DMA straight into your CPU. Um, so it's not great. USB is kind of packet-based and Firewire is kind of stream-based. Um, those are the technical differences. But basically, why don't we, why don't we have Firewire anymore? Anyone want to shout out? 
It's expensive, right? It's, why is it expensive? <laughs> exactly, right? So to me, uh, it's not like the VHS Betamax because it wasn't decided by the Los Angeles adult entertainment industry, but it's, it's like VHS Betamax in the sense that in some things and for some applications, Firewire, like you look at the spec and how it works, is much better suited. Like if I want streaming data, it's not a question that Firewire was a better spec. Um, and uh, it can do streaming and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, you had to pay licenses for every chip and you had to have the chip. So, unlucky Firewire. You will still find it in aircraft uh, avionics buses, actually. Um, so that was VHS Betamax. This is just a totally unsuitable combination, uh, <laughs> comparison, but uh, it's kind of interesting to me. Uh, again, I say I'm not a software guy, so, you know, shoot me. Um, USB has this hosting device thing, but it sends packets. They actually, it doesn't send packets, it sends a thing called herbs, which is a, a USB request buffer. Um, but uh, uh, Ethernet is also packets, right? USB, you can tier a load of devices together and each device gets an address, gets a place you can look at it and point to it. Ethernet kind of does that. Well, Ethernet doesn't do that, of course. But Ethernet just has MAC addresses and like Ethernet frames, but you can, you can stick uh, Novell IPX on top of your Ethernet, or IP if you're that modern, um, and, and, and you know, give everything an address you can talk to it. Um, uh, USB, that address is baked in, right? The order you plug the device in, that's the order it gets the address. Um, Ethernet, you can build whatever protocol you like on top of it, you know, TCP, UDP, all this stuff, um, raw ARP requests or whatever. Um, USB has predefined what we call transfer types. Um, in USB 2, there are basically three types. Uh, there are control, sorry, four types. There are control requests, bulk requests, isochronous requests, and interrupt requests, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But there's not this whole, like, you can build whatever kind of streaming protocol you want on top of USB. It's not like that. Uh, so it's very different to Ethernet in that way, but it's the same in one sense, and that is, well, it's the same in two important senses. One is that it's kind of got the notion of a packet. So USB data moves around in, in, in lumps, packets. And the other thing is that you can use Wireshark on it. And if you're gonna take away <laughs> five words from this talk is that, that you can use Wireshark on USB. Or oh, is that six words? I don't know. Um, so a USB device, if you buy a USB device, a well-designed USB device, which almost doesn't exist, um, <laughs> It has these various things that are in the standard called configurations, interfaces, and endpoints. And there's kind of a hierarchy like this. This is all on a very useful website called uh, linux-usb.org, um, which is, is useful if you want to know about USB, but if you want to write a USB driver, I suggest don't use it because that's how to write kernel drivers, which is a bit different to what we're going to talk about. Um, configuration is an arrangement of interfaces, all right? Most devices, by which I mean anything you want to attempt to hack as your first USB device, have one. So it's not too much of a problem. But a configuration could be, for example, I have a camera. That is also a USB missile launcher. But it can only do one at a time. OK, well, find me one and I'll believe it. But um, uh, maybe that was in, it, very rare you see a device with more than one configuration. Only one configuration can be active at a time. So what happens is you plug a device in, it describes itself to you, and you say to it, give me configuration one. Almost always you'll say, give me configuration one, because there will only be one. Uh, and it says, uh, very well, sir, here we go, here is configuration one. That configuration will give you a list of interfaces, uh, mostly one <laughs> interface, although uh, things like uh, multi and multi sort of devices which are, do more than one thing might have two. Um, so, for example, an FT2232 USB to serial converter has two interfaces um, for the two separate serial ports. The most important unit of this is that bottom level, which is called endpoints. Endpoints are basically things that you can point at and either send data to or receive data from. And again, in contrast to, to network, sort of Ethernet type networking, an endpoint can only receive or transmit logically, right? So if I have a device which receives data and transmits data, it must have two endpoints, one for in, one for out, at least two. Furthermore, an endpoint can only do one type of transfer. And we're about to talk about that, but I said there were several types of transfer. <laughs> How does a USB device self-describe? It uses a thing called a descriptor. Uh, that's, you know, kind of an obvious name, but basically what happens is your host can request a descriptor through endpoint zero. All devices have an endpoint zero, which just means the thing you ask for descriptors rather than the thing that actually does any work. Um, uh, which, so basically, um, if, we're in, uh, if we're in Linux, for example, my friend is LSUSB. I type LSUSB, it tells me about USB devices. Um, 
as you can see, I have a few interesting devices in this uh, in this one, for example, uh, Ericsson Business Mobile Network. So I have a, a, a WAN card in this laptop, and that's connected over the USB de device, uh, USB bus. What we're going to look at today, because I haven't got the camera working, is the Logitech uh, Ink unifying receiver. The interesting thing to look at this is, is on if you look at that Logitech Ink line, the second line from the bottom there, on the left it's got bus 002, device 009. So the bus number is is determined by which USB bus chip uh, is is connected to. So that's a physical location. Um, the device is assigned by the software stack, and there's no specified order. But in Linux, it is almost always assigned in plugging in order. So device ten is the one you plugged in after device nine, right, uh, etc. Uh, those are in decimal, obviously because none of them are above 10, so it wouldn't matter anyway. But <laughs> the interesting thing next, it gives you the ID. These two numbers, for the Logitech, it's 046D colon C52B. That number is obviously in hex. Uh, quite often you come across with only digits, so you don't know. But um, Those are called the ID vendor and the ID product. So all Logitech devices will have 046D, uh, and this particular product will have C52B. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this is that those two numbers are very important because it is how the USB stack in your operating system decides what driver to load and what, what how to talk to the device. Um, if you do LSUSB-V, you get quite a lot more information. Um, so this Logitech receiver, for example, we can see ID vendors, Logitech, unifying receiver. Then it gives us a configuration descriptor, how much power it can use. That's not accurate. That's just how much power that can be programmed in by the manufacturer. So you can believe it or not. Um, uh, now, next, I'm going to talk about the, the class there, human interface device, uh, protocol, keyboard. But basically, this descriptor tells you all the how the device describes itself. It's got an endpoint there, endpoint two in. So that's where the, the input comes in. Endpoint, it's got another endpoint, endpoint three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's your basic tool for looking at USB devices in Linux. Uh, that's an example of what a descriptor looks like. So I said that endpoints do transfers, or you transfer to and from them. Each endpoint can only have one type of transfer, and there are four types of transfers. Interrupt transfers, which are a guaranteed amount of bandwidth and reliable. So the USB protocol has this very complicated uh, negotiation of how much bandwidth something is using, has very complicated error checking, none of which I've gone into or I'm going to go into, but it's there. So if you're designing your own USB device, do not put a CRC in your data field. It's just wasted, right? Like the, the USB stack does all that for you if you use bulk transfers. But anyway, we've got interrupt transfers, which are things like kind of keyboards and mice and game pads and stuff, where you're going to pull it very often. It's going to tell you events. Um, you have isochronous transfers, which are they are they're not interrupt transfers in the sense that you're not going to pull them so often. They have bigger amounts of data, um, and there is no error correction. It's kind of like UDP packets in a sort of way to me as the, the layman, um, uh, and as the libUSB driver writer, that's all you need to know. Um, very rarely will you be able to successfully write an isochronous driver with libUSB, so not, no need to worry about it. It's too time sensitive. Um, control transfers and bulk transfers are generally what we're going to talk about, because that's what your normal off-the-shelf random Chinese device, which they've just slapped together for $10, actually uses to move data around, right? And control transfers are things like, turn this light on, turn this light off, fire a missile. Uh, bulk transfers are things like, uh, I'm sending you a picture, I've taken a picture, uh, here's a load of serial data, uh, here is the program to cut out laser cutter thing with. Um, yeah, each endpoint only supports one transfer, try it. Interrupt transfer is a misnomer. USB can't do interrupts, unlike Firewire. Um, <laughs> but yes, you, interrupt means I am polling you and asking you. So it's actually not interrupt, it's actually polling. Okay, but it's called an interrupt anyway. Um, the polling rate is entirely up to the OS. So, yeah. All clear? Great. Um, one of the best things about USB is that it has these things called device classes. So I said those those descriptors. There are a set of agreed on device classes, meaning uh, although universal serial bus is universal, it's going to be used for a lot of standard things. So they all sat down and agreed on a lot of these. You can see they had to go into hex, so there's more than 10, right? Um, 
Uh, zero, uh, unspecified. Great. That's the worst one. You don't want one of those. Um, but, okay, so we have things like audio, keyboards, HID. HID is a bit random because HID means human interface device, which can mean keyboard and mouse, or it can mean just device that will spit some random data at me that I don't know how it looks, like a Steam controller, for example. Um, I should have brought that along, actually. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, this is all fine. If your device is any one of these classes, you do not need to worry about anything I'm about to tell you. Anything. Because some smart, clever, and brilliant guy at Linux kernel has written a driver that exposes it into the Linux file system somehow. Even if it's just a HID device, it'll be in the file system. You do not need to worry about this. What you do need to, to worry about where we proceed is uh, that bottom one, vendor specific, right? Meaning any other. And at this point, when you can buy a USB coffee warmer uh, or like a you know USB Kenwood mixer or whatever, that is becoming a very large amount of things, um, which will never be USB. There will never be like a you know kitchen equipment uh, USB device class, so don't worry about it. Um, so basically, what I'm about to tell you is what you do when you want to make a USB device work that has a vendor-specific uh, class code. Um, in Linux, the, the USB stack looks like this. Uh, there's the HCD, which is the human control device uh, uh, driver stack, um, which talks directly to the hardware. There's a set a layer of things called USB core services, which are in the kernel and very scary and don't mess with them. And then there are sets of class drivers which are in user space, but they talk directly to the kernel. Um, so things like webcams and stuff like that, uh, UVC video and all that stuff is, is, all, is all at that level. Um, on the other side, there's a thing called USB DevFS, which is uh, file systems exposed, uh, bits in the proc file system exposed to you, which you can directly poke and prod USB devices with. And what we're going to talk about is, so in the, in the old days, uh, if you wanted to write a USB driver in, you could either write it in kernel space, scary, um, or you could write it in user space, not so scary, but you have to mess around with this uh, file system layer. Uh, there's now a thing called libUSB, which is what we're going to talk about, um, and, and that's how you do it now. So um, there are two scenarios now. You have a USB device, which is vendor specific. Uh, you're going to have to mess around with it to make it work in any meaningful way. Uh, there are two choices. Either we do write a driver or we do not. Uh, there is no try. So um, to write a driver, you should really only consider it if it's vendor specific. If it's not vendor specific, it should be done by the class driver. And if it's not, complain to your local Linux kernel hacker. Um, <laughs> A good case for this is when it likely does simple control transfers, your USB missile launches, right? Uh, that is probably just control transfers. So telling it to turn left and right, that'll be very simple. We'll, we'll go, go through that. Or it does basic bulk transfers. We'll get into this later. Things like USB temperature loggers, your USB smart energy meter or whatever, likely are doing bulk transfers to spit a lot of data at you that you could have just as easily done over a serial port. Uh, those are the, the, the cases. Um, or none of that's true, but the software you've got that's working is just totally rubbish. Um, and the definition of unacceptable to me includes only works on Windows, obviously, uh, or works on Wine, but it was written in Windows 95, or you have to use LabVIEW, um, or my, my, my half-baked GUI will be better than their half-baked GUI, <laughs> but I would caution you that that's never true. Um, no matter how bad theirs is, if you don't spend a lot of time on yours, it'll be worse. Um, when not to do it is if it's actually just a serial device or CDC device or TMC, which is test measurement class, which they should use more, but they don't. Um, in those cases, you should just talk to it as though it's a serial device. That's what the USB stack will handle all that for you. And then you just have to reverse engineer the actual serial protocol. And we're back in the old days. Um, or if you have something that's super fast, there's time guaranteed, the error checking is going to be too slow, it's going to drop a lot of packets on the floor if you do it through user space, needs a lot of isochronous transfers, you're going to have to write a kernel driver, and I have no idea how to do that. So... Uh, you know, that's, that's that. Um, or you can't be bothered. Um, but the point of this talk is that for something that's simple, you should be bothered because it's easy, and I'm going to show you how. <laughs> Five simple steps. <laughs> no, actually, three steps, but I'm going to flesh them out. One, get the device working in a, US, in a virtual machine. Uh, I use VirtualBox. OK, shoot me, whatever. Um, whatever you want that has USB device pass through, I'll, just, I'll show you that briefly. Two, you can use Wireshark to sniff USB packets. I can't stress that enough. So we don't even have to plug in the oscilloscope, right? Y you get the device working in your virtual machine. The virtual machine thinks it's talking to the USB device. You are sat over here. You can plug in Wireshark to grab the packets off 
that USB bus, right, and display them to you in a format that you can look at. And once you can look at the packets, and, and you see, this does, I don't mean look at in the sense of, oh, here's all this random error correction stuff. I mean look at as in tell me exactly what it's actually doing. And once you can do that, you can start to reverse engineer it. Three, write a program using libUSB or PyUSB, which on Linux is a wrapper for libUSB, a very nice one, um, to drive the device however you want. Right. So step one, LSUSB, I've, I've told you that already. Uh, that, that is the first thing you need to do once you want to reverse engineer a device is know what its ID vendor and ID product is. Um, and those numbers you can get from uh, LSUSB. Right. Step two, UDEV. <laughs> Marvelous. Everyone written UDEV rules before? Yeah. It's not quite as bad as it seems, right? Um, Nine times out of ten, the UDEV rule you will want to write uh, is something like this one. Subsystem double equal USB, that says if the device is a USB device, Atra's ID vendor is the vendor, Atra's ID product is the product. Now we know which device it is, and then you say mode single equals 0666, give me write access to it and read access to it, group equal users. Now, if you use a, an operating system like Ubuntu or something which is not SUSE, which is or Debian, which is the only two I know about, <laughs> really, then it might be slightly different, but that's how you do it. Um, so don't be afraid of UDEV rules. It's uh, actually not too bad. And of course, the ArchWiki has a page on it. Um, once you've written a new UDEV rule, um, no one saw my password there, right? <laughs> uh, of course not. Once you've written a UDEV rule, you have to reload UDEV. Which on SUSE you do like that. Uh, UDEV ADM control dash dash reload dash rules. So that's step two. We're two fifths of the way there. Now step three is a bit more involved. Um, step three, uh, I am. I, I have the camera over there. I was going to show you that I reverse engineered a few months ago, but I can't find a 12 volt power supply. So, um, oh, I did have one, but I've lost it. Um, so I'm going to show you how to reverse engineer a USB keyboard, which already works. Uh, but I give you the give you the, the steps. Um, Use VirtualBox. Use VirtualBox to install Windows. Ouch. Um, this might hit me with a you must upgrade to Windows 10 message, in which case I apologize in advance. Uh, we're going to watch Windows boot up now. No, we're not really. Um, so, well, we are. I'm going to talk over it, though. Uh, you, you. <laughs> You boot up Windows, and you need to install the extension. If you're using VirtualBox, you need to install the extension package from uh, from the thing, from the uh, the website. But what you can do with this is you can use this button at the bottom, USB pass through, to pass through a USB device to the virtual machine. And what that means is is that at the level of the USB stack, it will just be giving the packets straight to the virtual machine. So the virtual machine isn't like being in, it isn't being interpreted, the virtual machine sees it as USB. Now, this doesn't work so well for graphics cards as anyone who's attempted to game on uh, Windows through Linux with GPU pass-through will tell you, um, but it works incredibly well for USB devices and specifically for USB 2 devices. USB 3 doesn't quite work properly. Um, so if I just click that, this, uh, notice I'm pressing a button on this keyboard. Uh, hang on. I'm pressing a button on this keyboard is not being accepted by the terminal anymore because this keyboard is now connected to the Windows virtual machine. Uh, at this point, I would say that you um, install the rubbishy vendor software. I was about to show you one of the most... <laughs> this is literally the first time I've ever seen this message. I'm quite annoyed. Um, yes. I was literally about to show you one of the most hideously disgusting vendor GUIs for anything ever invented, uh, which was the uh, the other. I'm going to show you it anyway. Just to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, ugh. Ready? it's not that bad, but I mean, I've seen worse. But come on, like, here we go. Here we go. It's probably not even going to load now. Nope. Yeah. All right. You can tell I don't, I don't boot this virtual machine up that often, other than to other than to mess around with USB devices. It's coming. It's coming. Come on, Windows. Oh, hello. <laughs> yep. 
Right. Look, so what it does is it pops up a dialog box saying another application is still running, please reinstall. Um, <laughs> I trust you, it's pretty bad. It's called A plus interactive software, come on. Um, anyway, the point is that this keyboard, which wasn't working in the terminal before, is also not working now. Um, hang on. Shouldn't switch devices in the last, last minute in a demo. Oh no, it's coming! Ah, look at it. It's so bad. <laughs> what is this? Ah, uh, now go away. Ah, uh, right. Ah, uh, ah, right, Bing. Okay, look. I'm sorry. I... What the hell is happening here? So it seems like I haven't installed the USB Logitech driver on Windows. I do apologize. But anyway, the point is that when you click this button. Live demos never work, right? So I'm not going to apologize too profusely about it. Oh, device is ready to use. Here we go. <laughs> Does the mouse work at least? No. Doesn't matter. The next part of the demonstration is still doable. Um, <laughs> oh, please have mercy. Look, so <laughs> point number one is you can use Wireshark and USB packets. Point number two is never use Windows, right? Um, but the point is that if you fiddle around with this for a bit, I promise you, like super pinky promise, that you can get a USB device pass through working and Windows will think it is connected to that device and it will work as if it's on Windows, right? And then what I did with that camera over there is you plugged it in, you make it work as if it's on Windows, you run your rubbishy A plus uh, interactive software and uh, then your device is now working in Windows. It doesn't know that you're about to spy on it, which is our next step. For which, luckily, I don't need Windows anymore. So I, I'm sorry about that. I had to change devices at the last minute, and uh, that didn't work. But that's uh, basically the idea is get it running through USB pass-through in a virtual machine step. Step four, the fun and interesting and good part, which will work, I promise, is use Wireshark. So install Wireshark Shark using apt-get or whatever it is you use. Um, or zipper for us SUSE folk. <coughs> And then, step one, mod probe USB mon. So Wireshark have written a kernel module called USB mon, which essentially goes into the, uh, the, the Linux kernel stack, plugs in a module which listens to all USB traffic and gives you access to it in Wireshark, right? So step one, mod probe USB mon, right? I am not a hacker, but start Wireshark, ask for the root password, because you know it's important. Um, right. So if, if you've been to many reverse engineering talks about network stuff, you'll have seen slash be familiar with Wireshark. Um, but once you've mod probed that USB mon, I click here to start a new, uh, a new packet capture. Oh no, I click here to select an interface. Um, and you see I've got these interfaces, USB MON 1, USB MON 2, and USB MON 3. Those correspond to USB buses in my system. So I go back to my trusty uh, LS USB. I am going to look at our Logitech unifying receiver, which is on bus 002, which means I want USB MON 2. Start. Now. You see what this is telling me? This is telling me, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to make the text any bigger in that, but you can sort of see what's happening is USB packets are, are coming in. We have a keyboard connected. The keyboard, uh, what's happening here is the host is asking for USB interrupt in packets and the keyboard is sending it USB interrupt in packets saying, no, I haven't pressed the key. Oh, now you've pressed the key. Now you've pressed a different key. Now you've pressed another key, right? Um, the problem is, if you have, say, 10 USB devices connected on that bus, they will all come through USB Mon. You can use the Wireshark filtering rules. The first one I tend to do is this one. Um, I look up the address. Logitech unifying receiver is device 11. Uh, 
And then... Is this keyboard even working? Come on. Everything is going wrong. Like, the batteries are not even... I tested this literally 20 minutes ago. Not like an hour and 20 minutes ago, but come on. Are you kidding me? Don't think so. No. Man, you should never do this. Oh, hello. Okay. But you see now, it's a different USB device, so I have to look again. So now it is device 12 on bus 2. And now my backspace key has literally stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, this is like a good. This is a good session, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. There we go. Right. So, haha. <laughs> yes. So what is happening is, <laughs> our Wireshark is is asking for interrupts from the keyboard. The keyboard's mostly saying no, 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 no. But what you can notice is that it's not quite polling. It's not quite time polling. What's happening is you can set a timeout for how long the response is. So the host has to initiate communications, but it can say, send me a reply. Uh, you have up to 10 seconds to do so or something like that. So what's happening is the host is getting the response from the keyboard and immediately sending out another interrupt packet, right? And that's how multi-key press keyboards work. So it'll send one interrupt packet containing multiple key information, uh, right? But you can, so you can see what's happened there is the keyboard's just replied with a, an interrupt. Um, so once you have your filter set up, which I've now wrecked because <laughs> I was typing stuff. Um, let's look at a packet. Here's one. Right, so I'm looking at this packet. This packet I have highlighted here is the host saying to the device, send me an interrupt in. Uh, if you expand that bottom bit there, you can see This is the important bit. The first thing you need to know when reverse engineering and writing your own USB devices is what endpoint to do what. As you can see in this keyboard, it says here, endpoint 0x83, direction in. Now, endpoints are numbered systematically, so 0x83 is always an in endpoint doing uh, interrupt transfers, and that's part of the, how it works. So, so um, but 0x8, that means uh, interrupt in. Uh, or in, that means in, sorry. And the three might just is just the third endpoint. Um, so this keyboard inexplicably has three endpoints, probably because one's the mouse and one's a keyboard, and then it has the, the, the another one for some reason. Um, so that's so when you you write your notebook down how I'm going to reverse engineer this US, USB device, you basically play with the device through either your Windows virtual machine or the buttons or whatever on this. You watch what happens in the USB logs. You need to know what endpoints do what. So 0x83 is where my data is coming from the keyboard. And then you see the reply to this packet, which uh, Wireshark can tell us. All you're interested in in the reply normally is that bottom bit, which is called the leftover capture data, which is how much data we got back and what was it. So See here, we have binary data there. None of it's printable, so that's printable characters on the right. But two zero zero one zero one zero zero one five zero 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 zero, and then the fun begins, right? I've got you to this stage, <laughs> and then you work out what your device is doing. Obviously, you have a brain and know something about the device. For example, I'm going to talk you through several USB devices I reverse engineered using only this technique of just looking at what the data is, what endpoint it's going in, and, and how we got around working out what the data actually was. So this thing, um, this thing is an Aver Media CP155, the terror of classroom kids all over the world, presumably. It's actually quite useful. I picked mine up for 40 pounds. Discovered it only had that hideous A plus Aver Media GUI on Windows and Ubuntu support for Ubuntu 9.04. <laughs> only. <laughs> 
uh, yes, uh, it had its own kernel module compiled against kernel 2.6. whatever it was, and uh, nothing else. Um, but luckily, this camera, although it's a camera, and I say we shouldn't really do cameras in user space because cameras are shooting images, it's very low frame rate. And what it's actually doing is it is compressing the thing to a fully formed JPEG inside the camera, and it dumps it to you over a bulk endpoint as literally the contents of a JPEG file. And you can tell that because the bulk data in there just says JFIF, which is a JPEG header at the start of it, right? So actually, within about, I mean, it was overall getting the whole thing to work was quite difficult because it has a weird thing about how it splits the data up into packets. But getting to the stage of I know roughly how this device works took me about 15 minutes in Wireshark. Because every time a picture is coming in, I get this thing that has a steaming J JPEG header in plain text in the bulk transfer. And at that point, we know how it works, right? So then you, you do things like, what happens when I click start? Oh, it sends this control, that control, and the other control. So then I write my Python script to send those three controls, see if it starts capturing. It does, okay, there we go, right? And uh, I look at the Windows capture utility and I see what happens, what the images come back in. Oh, it's just raw JPEGs in bulk transfer. Write a Python script that grabs those bulk transfers and cat it straight out to a .jpeg file. That's the picture, okay? That's, I mean, and it turns out that that's actually quite a complicated USB device. It has like 150 control control packets. It, for, it can zoom in, it can turn the lights on and off, it can focus, it can freeze frame, all this stuff. And all you do is you just click the button in the Windows software, one USB packet comes in, we know what it is. It's that simple. So uh, I wish I could show you that, but uh, maybe I'll find a 12 volt adapter tomorrow and you can come and watch if you want some more advice on this. Um, Here's another one I had interesting with recently. This is a Newport 2936R. Unless you're really in the business of measuring absolute radiometry on detectors, you won't be interested in spending five and a half grand on one of these. But um, there's kind of an interesting point to make here that this has a smoking gun on the back panel there, a USB plug right next to a serial plug, <laughs> okay? Now, in the manual, they'll give you the serial commands. Um, so unless they're very, very, very like under under-occupied and have a lot of engineers with a lot of spare time, they are not going to seriously properly design all the hundreds of functions in this device as a proper USB device. They are just going to have a USB serial link which sends the serial commands over it. This is very common. The problem with this particular device and about a hundred others I could name, most of which are scientific or medical instrumentation, is that rather than doing the sensible thing of admitting that and giving you a USB serial adapter, they still do their vendor-specific thing and give you a crappy DLL that just has two functions in, which basically just send data over the USB bulk endpoint. This is extremely common, and probably it's how a lot of these type of devices, temperature logging, humidity logging, all these kind of data loggers actually work. They should just be USB to serial converters, but they aren't. But actually they are. All they do is send you serial data as if they had a serial port over a bulk endpoint. That is a huge number of devices, and this one was exactly like that. Thanks. Um, there are actually specific classes for this, TTY class, USB device class, which is like your serial proper USB to serial converters, and TMC class, which is test measurement class. This is a test and measurement instrument. It should be a USB TMC class. Uh, it isn't because... Uh, they are convinced that them giving you a 4K Windows DLL uh, gives them some massive value add. Um, but it doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, what I'm saying is, especially if you have a device that also has a serial port, that is 99% certainly what it's going to do. This you have never seen because there are only 10 in the world. They are built in a shed in Northampton. Um, there's no price because uh, it depends on you know how many holidays they want to take that year. Um, <clears throat> but interestingly, even super idiotic bespoke stuff like this that costs in excess of 70 grand per unit um, is based on really, really rubbish little Chinese chips that they've imported, right? And those little Chinese chips are based on, this is very similar to like the FX2 chip, actually. It's not the FX2 chip because of course it isn't, but it's like the FX2 chip. Um, less said about doing this, the better. This took me months of my life and then didn't get it finished but I was still using the same technique and I got it to almost work. So like that's, I, I overstepped with this one, but still, however exotic, esoteric and stupid your device is, it's probably pretty easy to reverse engineer. This one wasn't quite that easy, but most of it I had. 
Um, a couple of other notable examples. Did I not even put the laser cutter in? Oh, there it is, laser cutter. We have at MK Hackspace an LS3020 Chinese laser cutter, which is a, a thing of beauty. Um, and we bought it from Reading, I believe. Um, now, uh, I noticed, I looked up, because of course it only works on Windows in software that's basically in Chinese, but with English characters. Um, and like, I, I uh, which is, you know, not offensive. I mean, like, I would find it offensive to have to translate all my software into a foreign language, right? Because people can't be bothered to learn mine. But to, so, so I don't blame the Chinese for that. Please don't get me wrong. I'm just saying it's pretty bad to use. Um, so... I looked on the internet for people who tried to reverse engineer this, and I noticed that the incredible guys at London Hackspace had done some effort in reverse engineering this. This software inexplicably also uses a hardware iLock dongle. <laughs> right, so you have like a, a five grand laser cutter. This software is useless without a laser cutter, and yet you still you also need a little iLock dongle. Great. Um, now, those what the guys there had done is attempted to like convince to hack, to crack the software, basically like binary, reverse the software and, and convince it to launch without the iLock dongle. That would be step one. Um, uh, but it turns out that if you just plug this thing in through Wireshark and print something out, I, mean, I didn't have the laser turned on because this would have cost a lot in Perspex, um, but um, it just literally sends a string of what is almost unadulterated normal HPGL plotting language over a USB bulk endpoint and the printer then cuts that out. What an amazing world we live in, right? <laughs> so the software on the computer is not even driving the motors. It just sends it, uh, it sends it a literal plain text string in HPGL plotting language. The difficulty is it's not quite in HPGL plotting language, and uh, that, that's taken us a while. Um, but like that again, to get to that stage was about half an hour's work in Wireshark. By that stage, we knew that it was Basically, you could send it HPGL strings, and that's a fairly standard plotting language, right? It's similar to Gerber, not quite the same. Um, so I wouldn't say we've totally reverse engineered this, but we're at the stage where if you wanted me to cut out a hexagon using only a Python script on Linux, I could do it, right? So good. Um, um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is a brief introduction to uh, libUSB. So libUSB is a C library. Um, I'm personally more of a C++ person, but you can very easily write your RAI nice little classes around it. It's kind of uh, set up that way. Um, Py US, actually, Python has two sets of bindings to libUSB. One is a C types binding, which is just the C API in Python. I recommend you don't use that. There's this thing called PyUSB, which has a more Pythonic way of doing it. Um, let's see if this clicking this link works or not. So libUSB, um, for those, uh, has exceptionally good documentation. You're really getting started. It has two separate APIs, libUSB. It has a synchronous API and the asynchronous API. Now, doing asynchronous programming in C is a tad annoying. Um, the synchronous one will work for a lot of things. Your USB missile launcher only, almost certainly can use the synchronous API, which is very simple. And the synchronous API consists of three calls. That's it. You have to do a couple of calls to initialize the library. You go through the tutorial. It tells you that you, you get a thing called a context, which you do for a lot of these C-type libraries. So you get a context. You open a device. You have There's a nice function called open device by VID and PID, which it says not to use in real code, but I do, and it's fine. Um, the only disadvantage is if you have like five laser cutters plugged in, it'll always give you the first one. Yeah, big disadvantage. Um, well, it might be one day, but but anyway. So there's a nice little function somewhere else called find by USB and PID that opens the device, gives you a handle. Once you get that handle, there's these three functions. They're just normal C functions. They're not hideously nasty, allocate your own memory and you know clench for a seg fault kind of stuff. It's it's like you give it the device handle, you give it the the request type, which is in in the, a control request. Once something is a control request, it has a number called the request type. And each separate function of the device will have a different request type. So for example, your USB missile launcher will have left, right, up, down, fire. And those will be five different uh, request types. Wireshark tells you those in, you know, the request type is this. So you press left on the thing. Wireshark will tell you what left is, et cetera, et cetera. 
So if you wanted to do that, one call, libUSB device, uh, libUSB control transfer, you give it the handle, request type, the request, which is the data associated with the request, which sometimes is no data at all. And um, there's a thing called a value in the index, which are not used very often by most devices, but those are like sub requests. So like you can have huge like hierarchies of functions in some devices. The camera, for example, has a lot of them. And uh, you can give it this pointer to a data which you've allocated, actually. So this is why I like doing it in C++, because you can just wrap this up in a, in a, you know, using a standard vector or something. But um, that is the reply. I'll put the data in there. And so these are not too difficult to use. There's a huge suite of examples on the libUSB website and the PyUSB website. Py, PyUSB is, is simpler if you're Python guy, I guess, but um, I often like I like to write stuff like this in C++ because or C because um, then I can always C types it into Python or other language. You know, every language has a C foreign function interface, just about unless it's something really kind of. Look, look, I wouldn't use a language that doesn't have a C foreign function interface. Okay, um, <laughs> so 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 like you know, I would say that if you're going to write something like I'm going to write lib USB missile launcher. Uh, and publish it to the community. It should probably be written in C and libUSB, but you know, you do whatever you like. But uh, what I'm saying is, there's these three calls: libUSB uh, control transfer, libUSB bulk transfer, and libUSB interrupt transfer. And they're not that hard to get your head around. They're not any harder than the OpenCV C API. Anyone remember that? It was awful. Um, but uh, those three calls just do transfers. Each call does a transfer. This is the synchronous API, so it blocks. There's an asynchronous API, which is a bit more complicated, where you have callbacks. Um, but underneath, this is implemented using their own asynchronous API. So I would recommend that you just start off with the three libUSB synchronous calls. If you're a reverse engineering USB device, use Wireshark, find out what the control transfers and the bulk transfers are, write it down. Notebook is help a notebook is helpful. And then use these three calls. And just type the calls in order. It will blast them out the USB bus in order. LibUSB handles all the details of the USB stack, the descriptors, the configuration, everything like that. It's all handled for you, and you only need these three calls. And so you can write a 100-line C program that will do that. Um, I will show you my camera program, although I don't have the camera plugged in, so I can't actually demonstrate that it actually works, but it does. This is in the Pi USB rather than... Um, So, um, so this is how I wrote the basic script for capturing from that that camera over there. Uh, just a Python class, um, and you see this is using this is using Pi USB. There's this nice call here, USB.core.find. That just I said I've worked. I've, I know what the ID vendor ID product is. I give it that. It gives me back an open device. Job done. No worries. Um, I worked out what the endpoints were from from um, uh, from Wireshark 88 and 82. And I discovered that, broadly speaking, it did three different sort of kinds of requests, the, this, these three control transfers. And to start capturing, I just do this control transfer. And, and like that's how simple the code is. It's just do a dot control transfer to this point with this value. And I also have this function called get bulk image transfer, which is a little bit more complicated, but not too much. It just uses three USB bulk in calls. And that just dumps out a JPEG image from the camera. And this took me about two days of effort to write, and that included learning how to use Wireshark. So, you know, if I can do it, everyone can. Um, and so, uh, so I'll leave you on that. Please go away, buy all the rubbish Chinese USB devices that you're interested in, and uh, hack together programs on Linux using libUSB to make them work, because they can be done. And even I can do it. So thanks very much.